Whether you're a diehard sports fan, a hopeless romantic, or a comedy aficionado, the Xfinity 10G network was made for streaming it all. Worry less about buffering when streaming your favorite shows, movies, or live sports and enjoy a better way to watch. Xfinity gives you a reliable connection for streaming plus all the entertainment you love all in one place. Fear not, because now you can finally sit back, relax, and stream your favorite entertainment and sports like never before with the Xfinity 10G Network. Want the same expert advice you get from the pros in the store while shopping online at DiscountTire.com? Meet Treadwell, your personal online tire guide that matches you with the perfect tire for your vehicle. Get your best match in one minute or less with Treadwell by Discount Tire. You can support this podcast at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. Hey, listeners, I have an invitation for you. What kind of invitation? Come join me and Kevin in our awesome, fun side podcast, Married with Podcasts. It's really fun. It's when we take your questions and talk about your relationship issues. It's true. That's mostly what it is. And at least one of us <laughs> gives good advice. Uh, usually me. You can check nope. out <laughs> Married with Podcast by joining Stitcher Premium. You can get a free month of Stitcher Premium. Basically, it's like access to all sorts of premium content, not just ours, but the premium content of other podcasts, exclusive yeah. podcasts, stuff from Katie Kirk, stuff from Mark Marin, stuff from Comedy Bang Bang, all sorts of great stuff. You know, they also have hundreds of comedy apps. Albums, they do. too. I mean, there's all sorts of great stuff. And you can also get our podcast, These Are Their Stories, a week early and commercial free. Go to stitcherpremium.com slash crime and use the promo code crime. crime and get a free month of Stitcher Premium. You'll like it. You will like it. And if you don't, hey, you've tried it for free for a month. What can go wrong? Go to stitcherpremium.com slash crime, crime and use the code crime, crime. at checkout. I'm Rebecca Lavoie, and this is Crime Writers On, the podcast about serial, true crime, pop culture, and this week, Sarah Koenig, talking on the phone to a guy behind bars. But it's not who you think, necessarily. We'll discuss Serials Episode 8, then we'll talk about the new podcast from Michigan Radio to NPR. Believed looks at the Larry Nasser sexual abuse case through the eyes of his many victims. Joining me to get that done and a whole lot more is my real-life husband and true crime co-author, former TV journalist and real-life husband, I guess that repeats there, Kevin Flynn. Hello, Kevin. What are you drinking there in that I'm can? I'm not drinking anything. All no, I no, I, no, I'm actually curious. What are you drinking over there? Oh, Pass it's, it over. It's cider from the cute little orchard down in the street. In a can? Yeah, they're a making can? cans now. Not those huge bottles anymore. No, wait. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's Rebecca. It's an aluminum can with a sticker wrapped around yes. it. Yes. It's not like- uh, Welcome to New Hampshire, people. Yeah, that's pretty- It's not pretty, a printed can. It's pretty potent. Right, I'm going to try it. It's quite good. Ah, very good. Little right. local spicy apples. Okay. Also is it with hard us, cider? it is. Yeah, it's a hard yes. cider. Yeah. Please, nice. like I'm going to drink regular cider for this podcast. Made well, from Studio C I was confused and worried. <laughs> <laughs> also with us is journalist, true crime author, former defense investigator, licensed private investigator, and voter suppression watchdog, Lara Bricker. Hello, Lara. Yes, that's me. I was at the polls three times, keeping my eyes on things on Tuesday. <laughs> Wagging a I finger. I even got right up. I did. I got right up in my little, I got a chair and sat right next to the line that said, do not cross. <laughs> and I was like, I'm watching you people. Yep. You were taking photos. And if anyone tried to tell you what you couldn't, couldn't do at the polls, you were like, no, I know what yeah. I can and can't do at the polls. <laughs> yep. Yep. I was I was there. I was there for the long haul. I was the last person to leave the polls, in fact. Huh. Well, also with us is our captain of woke cynicism, the brilliant author behind the noir novels known as the City Trilogy and the... Ayatollah of our Patreon book club. Okay, Toby Ball. Hello, Toby. Hey, I was at the uh, I was at the polls too. I was doing <laughs> new voter were you registration. The... You were. How many did you guys get? A lot. We had sixteen hundred people. Yeah. Uh, <gasps> wow. Register. It was like a general. I and we're we're in a small town, but um, University of New Hampshire's there. Yes. So I would say of those sixteen hundred, probably. 98% of them were students. Right. Yeah. And it it involves like traveling a couple miles and it was raining. So it was a pretty, you know, it was a lot more than people were expecting. And it was, it was pretty cool. So uh, yeah, it was six hours of, of helping them 
register and, and figure out how to, uh, you know, fill out their ballots and where to put them in the machine and all that stuff. So it was, it was cool. It was really fun. Toby, did you meet Ace, a uh, public radio reporter, Casey McDermott over there in Durham at the polls? Because she was there covering it for New Hampshire Public Radio. There was actually a bunch of press. For a while, I was standing. So there was this big line that you had to go to to then get to the people who actually helped you register, yeah. which is a little more complicated this time around. So I was standing at like sort of the where you walked into this roped off area and just making sure they had the IDs and stuff that they needed. And I think the secretary of state showed up. Yep. And so one of his guys comes over and he's like looking at me and and I was kind of doing my thing. He's like, hey, you're pretty (laughs) slick. (laughs) (laughs) That's exactly what he said. And I was like, I was like, I don't know, what to, I don't know what to make of that, sir. Huh. Doesn't he know you're the Ayatollah of a Patriot book club? What was he saying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, I could tell he's. He, there's That's a little bit smart. of fear in his well, I'm really eyes. Impressed, impressed with you doing your civic duty. That was uh, for our listeners who don't know, like New Hampshire, like many other states, has new voting rules that have been contested in the courts and may or may not stand. Did make it a little bit more complicated for students. And that is great civic duty that you did there, making sure that people could vote. Good for you, Toby. I take Election Day off every year. Election Day is like Christmas for me. I love it. I worked until yeah. four in the morning. I'm so excited. What did, what did we say when we woke up on Election Day? Release the Kornacki. It's very exciting. <laughs> it's all very oh, yeah, exciting. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Anyway, um, quick piece of business. Next week, we are going to be talking about homecoming the TV show, of course, Homecoming is the adaptation of the Homecoming podcast from Gimlet Media. That TV show is on Amazon Prime Video. And if you're like Kevin and I, and you think you don't have Amazon Prime Video, a surprise, as we learned a couple of years ago, if you have Amazon Prime, like for your packages, you also have Amazon Prime Video. So I have learned recently that a lot of people don't know they have this service. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, well, I don't know what yeah. the video service is, but I get free packages. I'm like, then guess what? You can watch Homecoming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's Prime. That's and Prime. Jack Ryan. And uh, yeah. And Scott and Bailey. Shows. <laughs> oh, Scott and Bailey. I had to, oh my God. I have like two episodes left. I had to stop myself just so I could save it. And Bosh. Did you get my text last night about Scott yes. and Bailey? You never like responded. <laughs> I, I think I, I crashed after election day. But yes, you know, I would like whoever their makeup artist is, but I've already just convinced myself that like I live in their village and I'm friends with them. They live so, in Manchester I, you know. in England. It's not a village. It's a city, I think. Right. Well, in my mind, it's like a quaint little English village, you know, <laughs> with some crime and that we're friends and we might be neighbors and I might hang out with them, um, her mom. It's a quaint little village that needs its own murder squad. <laughs> like, yeah. It's not very quaint. Okay. It's all good. <laughs> Imagine if our town with the cider where they can't even like get cans printed, they have to put stickers in the cans. Imagine if we had our own murder squad, like how much violence there would have to be in this tiny no, town. <laughs> they'd be waiting home. around a long, they'd be drinking a lot of cider. Well, you know, I did read like three apple orchard murder mysteries a while back, so oh, you never yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> murder in the trees. <laughs> Somebody stole the cider that, qual- you know, constitutes murder. The in Macintosh murder. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. The Cortland killing. <laughs> <laughs> the Granny Smith ganking. The Honeycrisp hanging. <laughs> oh, God. See? There's so many. The possibilities are endless. We need to get our agent Charlene on the phone and start working on these books. <laughs> the yeah. Gala Goring. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> so many apples. <laughs> So Grafton's like rolling the, over a grave. I, but that's what I was going to say. You could do a whole alphabet of apples. The Fuji Fenestration. <laughs> the fe- <laughs> Fuji Defenestration. Uh, I'm sorry. I was trying to alliterate. I knew it wasn't right, but I figured maybe it would go by so quickly our listeners yeah, wouldn't hear that's it. That's fine. All right. Well, moving on. Shall we start talking about what we're actually being paid to talk about? Yeah, sure. <laughs> why, why would we do that? <laughs> Let's get into it. From This American Life in WBEZ Chicago, it's Serial. One courthouse told week by week. I'm Sarah Koenig. On this week's episode of Serial, A Madman's Vacation, Sarah Koenig looks at the country's juvenile justice and juvenile detention system. We meet Joshua, a teen who testified against his fellow gang members. And maybe, I just want to say as an aside, one of the best branded gangs ever, the Heartless Felons. I know it's a violent gang. It's an excellent- They sound like a a, a doo-wop group on the- It also sounds like very literal. Who are those guys? They're Heartless Felons. I mean, it's it's a good brand name. 
Okay, as an aside. Okay. Um, <laughs> Jesus. We learned that Josh has become another afterthought of the system, being thrown away by prosecutors once he's done testifying and beaten up inside detention by former gang members with the consent of the staff. Another attack, December 30th, 2016. Joshua's jumped again. This time, he firmly believes a guard made that happen. He'd just been moved to a new unit, and he started arguing with the guard on duty. Joshua said he went and took the unit phone from the guard's desk. It was a ploy to get some attention. He put it in his footlocker by his bed, wouldn't give it back. Meanwhile, the guard had ordered pizza for some of the kids on the unit. Joshua said when the guard came in with the pizza boxes, he told some kids, go get the phone back from Joshua, then you can have your pizza. Knowing full well, Joshua says, that that would likely lead to an assault. It did. Three kids jumped Joshua. It got out of hand. Serial again provides a tale of someone trying to do the right thing and paying the price for it. Now, Sarah does the thing in this episode that she did so well in season one. She talks on the phone to a sympathetic person who's incarcerated. Did you get that same uh, Sarah Koenig prison phone call feeling that you got in Serial season one, Kevin? Do you think she still got it in this regard? I think she still got it. She has. She didn't do a year's worth of phone calls. Mm-hmm. So yeah, she seems to have a um, you know a soft place in her heart for those kinds of stories. To be real, if you want the perspective inside a jail, prison, any sort of de- a detention facility, it, it's hard to get it from staff. Yeah, you know. So one place they tried. They tried. Uh, so to get it, you know, from the inside, and those are some, you know, if you find. The right guy. You know, the guy like you feel like shouldn't be there. It makes for really good audio. Now, um, I'm going to I want to get your guys responses to the same question. But, Toby, uh, one thing that stuck out to me in this week's episode, I know the people at Serial do not listen to our stupid podcast. And if they do. Hey, guys, what's up? But (laughs) um, there was (laughs) there was a moment um, in this week's episode where Sarah was like, we tried to get the other side on this. And to do so, I talked to this person, this person, and this person to sort of get that bigger picture. And I, I did feel like that was in response to not obviously not our specific like direct response. But, yeah. but didn't it feel like, oh, that's what we were asking for. And we've got a little bit of that now. Toby, did you pick that up, too? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was it was a little bit different than like other times when I've sort of objected to that in that they she did get sort of a third party mm-hmm. in the uh, person of that. Uh, I guess it was a therapist or a social worker. Yep, because she's she sort of bridges those two worlds, right? Right. And so I thought that that was, you know, in the place of being able to talk to somebody who's actually speaking for the prison or the guards or whatever. I thought that that was a good way of getting that same kind of other perspective. And I thought that was really good and helpful and, and made the whole thing a little bit easier to picture and like erase some of the doubts that you might have about a kid in that situation, maybe exaggerating things like not maybe necessarily lying, but just kind of exaggerating numbers or, or frequency or something like that. And, and, I certainly didn't end up with the sense that that was the case. What did you think about all these phone calls that Sarah had with both Joshua and the other uh, man that she talks to, Joshua's cousin, in prison? I know that there's been some chatter on social media about sort of like the tone of those conversations. What do you think of them, Toby? You know, for the most part, I thought it was fine. I think there was a funny, and I, I couldn't really, you know, I don't want to put myself in her head as to what she was thinking when it happened. But when she was talking to the one guy, she starts to dawn on her that he was the guy who sort of put out the hit, as she puts it, on Joshua. Okay. So you did you know this, like, this hit on him was going to happen or no? Yeah, no. Oh, you knew. Okay. Can I ask, did you order it? Am I talking to the man who ordered it? (laughs) Uh, uh, yeah. I guess she's just kind of nervous about it or whatever, but, you know, the way it, it kind of comes out is a little, I don't know. It, it just seemed kind of funny. Uh, when it was done, I was like, hmm. But there was something going on there with her, and I, I couldn't figure out what it was, but it did come through in her voice, I thought. I think, and, you know, I it's funny because I the, the one objection I have when I see this, like online and people sort of talking about Sarah Koenig and her interview style and the way that she gets people to talk to her, 
what you said, Toby, I think was fine. I think that we hear sort of some insecurity there and she's getting somewhere and all of a sudden she feels weird about it. But she leaves that tape in, which is an editorial choice, right, to hear her voice ask, answering that question. I mean, it would have been very easy for her to cut away from herself and just said, you know, and then I asked him a tough question. I asked him if he was the one who put out the hit and here's what he said. And she could have she didn't have to leave herself in asking that. Clearly, she was getting a little bit uncomfortable. It does bother I like the me. reveal, though. So did I. Yeah. But it, it does bother it was good me. T- it was good yeah. tape. Yeah, yeah definitely. It, it bothers me when people describe Sarah Koenig as flirtatious. It really does, because that is a singular sexist uh, view of that. It's very much a male gaze view that when a woman is personable, when a woman is nervous, when a woman is a little bit unguarded in, in interviewing a subject, I've never heard a male interviewer described as flirtatious ever. And I've heard male interviewers sound just like this, like discovering things as they interview people. You mean you, you didn't find Matt Lauer flirtatious? <laughs> oh, well, maybe Matt Lauer. <laughs> but that's a different... Flirtatious isn't the word. <laughs> that's just a different... Uh, I think that, yeah. I mean, I think David Letterman was frequently flirtatious. Yeah, that's different context, though, you know? He's not interviewing felons. <laughs> exactly, uh, exactly. Sarah is very comfortable with with certain people, and but you, it's not like just the guy in prison. I mean, you hear that th- through almost all of her interviews, face to face interviews. She is well. She described herself an interlocutor. Well, she's also like a little bit back on her Remember, heels. Yeah, and I think she's always she's learning as she's talking, and she lets the subject see that she's learning as she's talking. She's not afraid to show like I don't really know a lot about this. Tell me more or. Wait a minute. Did you just say what I think I heard you just say? She doesn't feel like she has to go in with like the I know more than you do and I know what you're going to say attitude. See, the only time I think it sounds like it comes up where people say they get the idea that it's wrong. It's about the person that she is interacting with. Like if it's somebody who they think is a bad guy. Yeah, then just that, like you should Right, that and you should not be friendly with them. Yes. So if it's that nasty cop or it's somebody behind bars. Or it's that guilty Adnan Syed. Behind bars. <laughs> With his right? big cow eyes. I can't believe she would make that comment. Right. That it should so be, inappropriate. It should be more straight on, professional <laughs> as opposed to the way that she is sort of with everybody. But that's not how she gets people to talk. I, I know that. I'm not saying that, that that's right. I'm saying I think that's where the source comes for some people. I think what it is, as I listen to her interview people, I mean, it's like you definitely I feel like, and you know, I experienced this you know, going between interviewing people that were incarcerated, people that you know, had criminal records or whatever, and then people that you're interviewing for journalism stories, you kind of have to adapt. Like, I mean, this is what I do anyway, my personality to where I'm at. So sometimes I might be a little more conversational like she is based on the situation because that's how you're going to get the best information out of the other person that you're talking to because they're going to feel more comfortable, you know? Right. So I think you kind of just adapt to the situation you're in. And as she was talking to this guy, she was, you know... That's what she was doing. Uh, it, I mean, it was it, it kind of made me laugh when I was like, it was, you know, it's just kind of funny because she does also sometimes come across sounding, I don't want to say naive, but she sounds sort of like the way that she asks the questions sometimes sounds sort of innocent in a way. Right. Because she's like, oh, you know, like when my kids go to school and, you know, she's so she's she's definitely comes across like that. But I think it's just you have to read the situation. I would say that little line that was written that was not part of an interview where she said, when my kids do a field trip where they have to walk five mm-hmm. blocks, I have to sign a thing. That actually struck me as like a little bit like too like, oh, uh, this is so different from what I know. Yeah, that That, that actually took me out of the texture no, of but the episode. She prefaces that yes, by explaining. But it sounded to I me. I know it's apples and oranges. To me, it sounded like not acknowledging that this is actually the reality for many, many, many people. No, I think it's exactly up. I think it is. I think she's talking to an audience that maybe needs that, but it it stood out for the texture for me. Anyway, let's move along. Laura Bricker, let's talk about the uh, Brichter scale situation. (laughs) It's the (laughs) Brichter scale! Uh, How did you feel about Josh being pulled out of bed in the middle of the night by the FBI Taken and being offered a deal and repeatedly asking for his mother, not being given his mother and never asking for a lawyer and the police never uh, suggesting to him that he get one when he was, what, 15, 16? How would you feel about that, Laura? I was on the boom, boom scale there. Yes. Um, <laughs> like Josh. Boom, boom. Um, boom, boom. I'm going to start using that. I like that expression. I but like it too. I was just, I mean, it, I think when you hear things like this happening to juveniles, it, it for me anyway, it like makes me even, it's like a trigger for me. I'm just like, what? Like, you know what? Common decency. Let's look at like Brendan Dassey. Let's look at other juvenile cases. I mean, 
regardless, obviously, you know, Josh eventually, you know, he he acknowledged his role in all of this and, and that, you know, he played a part in these robberies. But that doesn't mean that he shouldn't get a fair treatment by the detectives and that he should, you know, it just seemed absolutely ridiculous. And and what makes me crazy is that it's okay for them to question someone without their parents like mm. this. I just, and, and this has come up time and again where I'm like, I just can't believe that that's okay. It just seems so wrong to me. And in this case, look at the snowball effect that this had where it goes from, you know, he doesn't get a lawyer. He thinks he's getting a good deal. He does his part. And I'm just like, oh, my God, I can't believe this kid is still testifying. And then he just gets the shit kicked out of him over and over and over again. Like, and then they don't they don't care. Yeah. So I was pretty enraged about the entire situation because it was just. You know, clearly he had some issues. Clearly he was involved in some things, but that doesn't mean that he he doesn't have rights. Right. Uh, you know. Anyway, so I was I was um yeah I was there. I was really struck with the descriptions of Josh uh, Joshua as a witness and as a person, and his like incredible recall and his ability mm-hmm. to his like sort of encyclopedic knowledge of the inner workings of this gang as a very yeah. young kid. Yeah. And like the fact that the cops really seem to tap into that the same way you know we we, we hear his um public defender immediately sort of realize this is somebody who's really bright this is somebody who really gets it this is somebody who has a lot to offer uh and with this amazing memory and this amazing ability to articulate all these things and the cops are sort of like oh yes yeah, it's a resource that we can use we hear in other episodes you know that there was a whole episode about how the cops want more cooperation from people in the community from witnesses and the fact that people won't cooperate is such a stone wall and now we have uh, somebody who's actually cooperating and doing that exact thing and, and you still can't win you you cannot <laughs> that, that seems to be the theme here I think if there is you know a, a recurring theme in all of these, individual stories that make up season three of Serial is that what is wrong with the system is that it keeps turning around and zapping the people involved in the way you think it should work this way. And here's the way it's actually working. And it's kind of unexpected in the way that people are getting screwed. And to me, I thought, like, oh, okay, this is, is something – this is the commonality, really, in all of these individual stories. Is like you think, like, the right way of it happening would be this – but then all of a sudden, all these other things start to happen, and the cumulative effect is very bad. You know, I, I, I agree with you. I think part of it is, and this is how they started the series, and I think that it comes up again now, is how siloed everything is. Each step doesn't seem like they communicate very much with the next step, so that it seems like in Joshua's situation, he cuts this deal, and, he, and he's really helpful and stuff, and your expectation would be, well, that will... They'll keep him safe. They won't like throw him into a prison with that same gang that he just like gave all this information about. And yet they do. And there's no there's no sense of the fact that he's cooperated in the past. And as a matter of fact, he, he seems to be almost singled out as being a troublemaker for getting the crap beat out of him all the time. And another thing that I think kind of played into a little bit his treatment and they don't she doesn't describe him physically i guess maybe she doesn't even see him she's just talking to him on the phone but a few times like people talk about how strong he is yeah good fighter like how physically powerful and how how good a fighter he is so i think you know another possible aspect of that even going back to the fbi is that from the descriptions that people give him he probably doesn't look like a little kid, which I, I'm not making any excuses. Like there's, there's no reason not to allow his parent or, or get him a lawyer or whatever. But that was just a part of it that kind of, kind of stuck in my head as I was trying to visualize things that happened. Well, he was a kid. I mean, they had to have known how old he was when they came, went to his house and arrested oh, yeah. him. Now, earlier in the series, we talked about how a lot of what we've heard about the justice system in this podcast hasn't felt like news to us. Because we're tapped into these criminal justice issues. We listen to a lot of podcasts. We listen to a lot of reporting about the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Juvenile justice system is a different story. We haven't heard a lot about that. There's a reason why we know, because like there's no information available because you're sealed. Laura, do you think that, you know, this is fodder for some editorial probing? Could this have actually been a season of serial, this this juvenile justice system? Absolutely. That's that was exactly what I thought when I started listening to this episode. I was like, 
wow, she has only touched the surface of the issues in the juvenile justice system. And I feel like, you know, that was one of the things we did say earlier in earlier episodes, like with with kind of all the podcasts that came after Serial Season 1, we've learned a lot about the criminal justice system. The juvenile justice system is a whole different place and I think really worth looking into. And, uh, you know, so we're going to get two episodes maybe about this. I, I think that if that had been this whole season, it would have just blown it off the charts. I agree. I mean, I think that one of the most interesting aspects of what we heard in this episode was she talked about how there had been a consent decree to improve these juvenile detention facilities. And they were having their, quote, like golden age, you know, where they were winning award, national awards for their care mm-hmm. of kids at the same time that guards were taking money from inmates to buy pizza and then using the pizza as a reward for inmates to beat up another child inmate at the same time. I mean, this is when they're in their golden age where things are going really well. And then we hear that super angry judge looking at the Instagram photos yeah. being posted <laughs> from yeah. inside the facility. Your kids are like Instagramming about their weed smoking and cash businesses. What do you think about that, Kevin? A couple of things there, you know, about contraband uh, yeah, I th- I think that you might expect that there would be drugs smuggled in and cell phones. And I'm thinking, cash, though. The guys are paying cash is contraband. Who is smuggling cash into the prison? I'm like, oh, well, I'm I sure- think we heard that in this episode. It was the guards. Yeah, but you're like, Here, here's a bunch <laughs> of cash, and then I'm going to get it back from you? I'm sure all of the money makes it where it's supposed to go. It's funny because this is kind of like the behavior that you expect from, uh, you know, an adult prison, like, in you know, st- the state penitentiary. Orange is the new black. Yeah, like, you know, um, that it also happens at the juvie level to this extent I I was surprised at. And we got confirmation of it, as we talked about earlier, not only from the social worker who ran that program, but then from the former employee. Yeah. And then the guard who's now incarcerated himself. (laughs) Surprise. Yeah, and the thing about the judge, and maybe we can come back to that, but uh, yeah, I was just- No, talk about the judge. (laughs) I thought she was great. I'm glad she didn't put up with any crap. And they they pulled the people from the corrections department in. I'm like, oh, this is isolated. It's like, really? This is you know, this has happened 36 times on you know on these different posts. You know, it's like either you're lying to us or you don't know what's going on in your your prisons. Hmm. Your your not your prisons, but your detention centers. Yeah, I'm like good on them for like saying, you know, this means more to me than just shipping the kid out into the next silo. I'm going to be looking back down the road because I'm assuming that if I'm, you know, sentencing them to this because we're going to the juvenile system, it's supposed to be about rehabilitation. Right. It's not supposed to be about punishment. It should be something. Well, we hear sort of the echoes of what sounds like efforts at rehabilitation as we hear Josh describe the experience, especially in the first facility he's in. There's this, you know, they talk about the school. They talk about that program he was involved in. Mm -hmm. He was the longest a uh, person who worked in that program, like he was there for two years in that program that mm-hmm. was sounded like a really positive and healthy way to sort of connect him with his feelings and also like, you know, just have him start coping with some of the trauma and damage that he had, you know, experienced in his life. It's the Yale of jail. Yeah. And then we hear that, you know, they have school requirements. He's trying to get his GED. He's just trying to go to class. He gets attacked. The gangs are rampant. They're literally raiding each other's dorms, basically, like taking over. Like you're not allowed to eat if you refuse to belong to a gang. There's, you know, all these like crimes. You have to get three bodies inside of juvenile detention in order to like make it into these gangs. Toby, like this is a real dilemma. You know, we this is all already the struggle between housing and rehabilitation. And then you have this problem where gangs just don't exist in these facilities. They're actually created in these facilities. Like the power centers of these gangs is these juvenile detention facilities. How did you feel when you listened to that kind of just description of how this all works? Uh, yeah, it's a mess. I mean, there's just you could, we could talk for an hour about this, right? Could have been a whole podcast series, Toby. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think so. I mean, I think that was one of the frustrations of this season is that it seemed like there were two or three sort of stories that they could have spent an entire season on, which would have been sort of more rewarding than just touching on them. Yeah. I mean, I think especially in in these juvenile situations where, you know, the vast majority of them are going to be getting out when they're 21, right? So since they will be leaving, it's in everybody's interest to give them some skills and, and, you know, mechanisms 
to cope once they leave or, or, or be successful. But then it seems like they have to put so much energy into just keeping things under control. Mm. And I don't know if it's the only way or it's the easiest way. You get the, the most reward in some way for these guards that to basically delegate it to either the gangs or whoever seems to be the toughest person or crowd in that in the, whatever group they're overseeing. It seems like each step you're taking, you're getting a little bit further away from what is sort of the stated and you know sort of the logical goal, which is get these kids. You've removed them supposedly from a situation in which they were, you know, getting into trouble, but you're not putting them in a situation where you can help them. It's more just kind of keeping them under control, and in some people's cases, just trying to keep them safe. It's a long way of saying, yeah, it it it's it's fucked up. It's not only kind of messed up, but it, it seems <laughs> like it's hard to look at it and say, well, this is the solution. Right. Well, Laura, we also hear about some of the behavior of some of the corrections officers in charge of these kids. Thoughts? Um, which part? How they're having sex with them? Yeah. I was like, are <laughs> you freaking kidding me? Like uh, for money? Oh my word! Right? Yeah, just absolutely crazy and the fact that they're they're basically you know instigating these fights and orchestrating and condoning and not doing anything and especially the one with poor josh when they had him handcuffed and these people are like stomping on him and they're just like yeah we'll use the um not emergency call so that people just kind of saunter in here but the, the sex with the children really mortified me um just horrible I really liked Josh. I have to tell you, yeah. like even the stories about him, you know, sort of in contrast to Jesse, the other character we get on the series who I think has, you know, we know he's experienced a lot of trauma. We also sort of hear him being like knuckleheaded over and over again, like creating frustration in listeners with our allegiances. Mm hmm. Josh is imminently relatable. We hear there is, you know, I think the gang situation Unless you are completely tone deaf and like did not listen to this episode, it becomes pretty clear that like not being a member of a, a gang is like basically not an option, either in the community or inside prison. I mean, it's just not an option if you want to eat, if yeah. you want to survive, yeah, if you want to be right. safe. It's just the way you get through your childhood in this community is to affiliate. Clearly, Josh is not particularly loyal to the gang lifestyle <laughs> since he was super willing to like when asked to do the right thing, do the right thing. And even that story about him, you know, he's not safe. He has serious justice issues. He reminds me a lot of one of my kids, actually. And the way he sort of decides to deal with it, just like take the phone and like put it in his foot locker and lock it. <laughs> it's very easy to sort of say, like, you know, you don't do that kind of thing when you're in when you're incarcerated. But like you can tell he's really trying to just he says he's not safe. He makes the complaints. He's in the mentorship program. Like, he's a very likable, relatable character that I found myself really rooting for. And I just found myself through this, this whole episode feeling so much dread, especially earlier in the episode, people saying, like, well, you know, that was kind of the start of when this all happened. I'm like, what happened? Is Josh going to be OK? Are we going to find out later in this episode that something happened to him? And then we found a lot of things happened to him. I don't know. I found it really challenging in that regard because for the, in this season this is one of the first characters that I felt like even though we only heard him on a phone tape in prison like I got him and I do feel like he could have been a central figure although it is challenging Kevin you and I wrote a book in which there was a juvenile justice system component and we basically had to fill in the blanks with those chapters because you just can't talk to anybody you can't get any information it's really tough right yeah, I wouldn't say we filled it in. I mean, I no, think we had to like factual. jump over it. Yeah, <laughs> we had to explain that we couldn't. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and what could have been four chapters was then just a part of another chapter. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, because it's really hard to get into that. It's a lot hard to get the cooperation. Um, so anyone besides me a surprised to hear that this was the second to last episode of the season of Serial? Laura, were you surprised? Um, I was pretty surprised. Um, I thought we had like three or four more episodes left. So yeah, I uh, I don't know how they're going to wrap this all up in one more episode, but I guess we'll see. All right. Well, let's do what we do. Let's give this episode a grade. Season three, episode eight of Serial, A Madman's Vacation. Laura Bricker, on a letter grading scale, what grade do you give this episode? And briefly explain why. I'm going to go with A because I think that out of the topics that we've heard this season, this is a really important one to explore. And I thought the characters were compelling. The story was compelling. You know, I think that this is more of what I would like to hear um, from Serial. What about you, Toby? What letter grade do you give season three, episode eight of Serial, A Madman's Vacation? Yeah, I, I'd give it an A, too. I think this is 
easily the strongest episode this season. And, uh, you know, I agree that Josh is a compelling character and he's, I, I think you do end up, I don't know if rooting for him is the right word, but you're, you're really hoping that things work out for him. Mm-hmm. It's a little frustrating to me that after, you know, cooperating, I mean, I think every, all, all these, all these kids in there, but especially somebody like that who's cooperated has put himself into danger that he doesn't have some kind of advocate yeah. uh, when he gets into these situations, which, you know, the detention center administration either doesn't know about or they know about and they don't care about or whatever. So anyway, yeah, it's a little Brichter scale for me, but I give it an A. Yeah, I'm going to give it an A for a standalone episode quality. I'll give it an A minus overall because I do feel a continuing sense of disappointment at the disjointedness of this season and how good this episode was really pointed me to how much more of this kind of content I would have loved to have this season. These kinds of threads that are complete, that are fully reported, that feel like a brick in a wall that is being built. Uh, that's what this episode felt like. But then hearing it as the second to last one, I realized I don't have much of a wall here. I just have like some bricks. <laughs> um, so A for content. Are you are afraid she won't solve the whole criminal justice system uh, no, in one more episode? No, that's not what I wanted her to do, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin, what about you? What letter grade do you give this episode? I'm going to give it an A-. minus. I mean, I think it's one of the better episodes since uh, earlier in the, the season. And it was great because it did take an angle that was not new ground for serial and I'm glad actually that they didn't decide to do a whole season on this juvenile detention center it would really come off as being super derivative of season one and you can't really live up to season one in in any fashion apparently but I thought it was really great to look at this aspect because it is a part that we haven't seen before and it informs what we kind of know about the rest of it and yeah I also had a little bit of a Brichter scale there Uh, it it was really hard to you know to see these stories of kids that you know are told to do this is the right thing and they go along and do the right thing and they just don't get the support which reminds me of the arch support system that is built into every bomba sock oh it's just like that it's just that, like that's that. what i was thinking it would solve yeah. everything let's say it would solve every, everything but it will help your feet it's true uh with the arch support system that provides extra support when you need it the most and a cushioned footbed that's reinforced for comfort without added bulkiness Bomba socks feel like a hug around your foot. They do. Yeah, they researched for like two years. Oh. And some people were trying to cure cancer. Good on them. This is way better. <laughs> is it? I love my socks. Okay. Yes. I'm guessing that anybody affected by cancer might disagree. Okay. But I do love my socks too. I, okay. Yeah. All right. Kind of a bad flex. <laughs> I get it. I'm actually wearing mine now. <laughs> You're wearing your socks? Are they sliding down your feet? No, they no, are awesome. Not. I'm going to have to get some more. I love them so much. They have that stay up technology and they have super soft cotton that you just never really want to take them off. So whether you're a runner, a rage walker, a power lounger, a basketballer like Toby Ball. Are we the power loungers in this scenario? We're the power loungers. We are. Laura is the rage walker. Yep. Toby yep. is the uh, basketball player. Yeah. This is the Bombas are the official socks. We're a diverse group. Of Toby Ball playing basketball. <laughs> so diverse. Uh, go to bombas.com slash crime, crime and use code crime and you'll get 20% off your first order. See what we've been talking about all this time. It's Bombas, B O M B A S dot com slash crime. Crime. Use code crime, crime and you'll get $20 off your first order. Bombas is one of the first ever podcast ads I ever heard. And I'm just so thrilled that they still sponsor this show. It's one we of the first podcasts ever first. did. Yeah. But it's also one of the first ones I ever heard. And I just really love, I love the socks. I do. I love them. And I love that they support podcasts like ours. What else you got, Kevin? Support for today's show comes from BioClarity, Ooh. the easy to use three step s- skincare routine that's 100% vegan plus gluten and cruelty free. So you can get the complete skincare kit that offers, you know, two different daily routines delivered straight to your door. So one of the things that you, actually we both did, I mean, not together, but we have done the mask. Yeah, I love a mask. I we did know the, you love a mask. <laughs> it was new for me. You love it. I did the mask and, you know, it was you great. You love walking around in that mask, taking pictures of yourself. You love it. Yeah, the clear skin routine contains nourishing plant extracts like chamomile, green tea, and cucumber to soothe. Combination oily or breakout prone skin. I'm a little oily. Yeah, a little bit. What about you? I'm combination. I'm oily here, dry here. You're combination too. 
Oh, really? I yeah. just can't be one? Yeah. I thought oily helps me look younger, longer. It does. It does. It preserves you. Yeah, but then I leave <laughs> smears everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> you know why I don't have any freckles? Why not? Because they would slide they off. They slid right <laughs> off. Oh. <laughs> oh, but I have to tell you about this because it's important. Floralux. Yeah, what's it's that? It's bio... Clarity's unique ingredient. It has an antioxidant and an anti-inflammatory property that feeds your skin from the outside in. Wow, that's great. I'm trying to imagine what a cartoon of that would look like. <laughs> so, yeah, it's all great. Get started on healthier habits with your skincare. Go to bioclarity.com. Our listeners will get their first month for 50% off Ooh. a routine plus free shipping. It's a good deal. And it comes with a 100% risk-free money back guarantee. But Stuff you need smells to, really good. Yeah, you need to enter code CRIME. CRIME. When you go there, that's bioclarity.com and enter code CRIME. CRIME. Moving on. The podcast Believed looks at the case of Larry Nasser, the U.S. gymnastics trainer convicted of sexually molesting 200-plus young girls oh. over a 25-year period. We can't even get through reading this intro without Laura uh, Brichter scaling on us. A collaboration between Michigan Radio and NPR, the podcast talks to Nasser's victims, their families, and the police about how the doctor, who was so respected in the sporting community, was able to get away with his crimes for decades. Decades. As the title implies, it was often a matter of being believed or not. Larry Nassar abused women and girls for more than 20 years. With disturbing news in the world of elite gymnastics, the former team doctor. And a lot USA of people, they think they know this story. Dozens of survivors shared their stories in court. Over and basically giving him more than a century in jail. But serial predators don't just get away because of sloppy police work or inept institutions. They get away because we let them. Those fears go through your head the whole time. What if I'm not believed? Hosted by Lindsay Smith and Kate Wells, the series gives a nuanced view of where the blame actually lies. It unpacks the many ways parents, police, coaches, and sports officials either willingly or unknowingly enabled one of the biggest serial sex abusers in American criminal justice history. Now, Believed has many descriptions of sexual abuse that are surprisingly powerful. We're going to do something we've never done before. We're going to just give a little trigger warning for our listeners. If this material is too upsetting for you to hear or you just want to stay spoiler free to our thumbs up or thumbs down review of Believed, feel free to jump ahead to the review part of this podcast. We have put that time code right in the notes so you can find it right there. Now, one of the first things I want to talk about is the attitude of this podcast, because in the first two episodes in particular, I think the hosts are very matter of fact. And, and, you know, the first episode, they talk about Larry Nasser as Larry, and they very clearly want to describe a full person who was viewed from by the outside world in a certain way. They sort of ask the question immediately. Was he a creep? Couldn't everyone immediately tell he was a creep? And they make convincing case that no, everyone couldn't tell because he was just Larry. You have to protect your athletes. You have to let them know that we care. You have to not let them know, but let them feel it. Let them understand it. Let them breathe it. It's it's there. You know, it's not just a pat on the back. You know what I mean? It has to be sincere. Larry was the guy who saw you, who protected you. This is how he earned your trust. But there's also been some blowback about sort of the attitude of this podcast and its matter of factness. And sometimes it's, it's a lightness around this subject. Kevin, I'm curious to know your thoughts about that. It's light around the subject? Well, there I've, I've seen criticism about. Now, I'll just be real. I don't think it's light. Yeah. I think these hosts do a really great job of making a topic that would be very difficult and traumatic for people to listen to, including me, listenable. By the way they deliver it, I'm just curious to know about your thoughts about the delivery of the show. Okay, so we're talking just about the hosts and for their, a second? Yeah, and their okay. delivery, yeah. All right. It's the only criticism I have of the whole podcast, which is they are trying awfully hard to sound conversational mm -hmm. in a weird kind of way. And I'm just going to say, it's like the first time they've ever listened to a podcast. And it's like, if, so, if I worked with somebody who talked like that, and it's certainly not a girl thing but it's just like they're just trying so hard to just sound like they're being conversational that it like all of a sudden takes me out a little bit and i think when you go back and listen you're not going to be able to unhear it 
Hmm. But I wasn't going to bring it up, but you asked the question. No, I'm curious. I've seen other people give the same criticism. Oh, you have? Okay. Yeah, and I, I don't I don't agree with, I mean, I agree with, there's something off with the editing of, uh, of uh, yeah. the reading. Yeah. I do think that it sounds like they worked to make it sound a certain way. Mm-hmm. But I also understand why they did. Mm-hmm. I understand why they made that choice, because- if, if you, you read it like it's frontline and it ends up getting too heavy. If you go straight into yeah. a podcast and go talk about, we're going to be talking about a guy who put his hands inside young girl's underwear mm-hmm. while he massaged himself with lotion under a blanket. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to fucking listen to that podcast. I'm going to be real. I'd be yeah. like, wow, that's probably really important. And I probably should listen, but I don't want to. Mm-hmm. And I think what they what they were trying to do here, and I think they did a good job of trying to do it, even if it wasn't 100% successful, was making me actually want to listen to this yeah. show. I don't have a problem with the scripting of it or anything like that. I just think the performance, the delivery is is forced. Yeah. Well, let's just talk about that topic of that first episode. I think uh, the first two episodes of this podcast, I would say, should be essential listening for anyone not only who's followed this case, but anyone as a human in the world, especially people who have kids. Because I do yeah. think with the Larry Nassar case... A lot of us, including me, it's very easy to look at the guy in the prison suit in the courtroom who's molested. Now we've known hundreds of kids and say, everyone had to have known or people should have known there was something off about this guy, right? Yeah. Laura, what do you think? I mean, don't you think it was important for us to know that that was not, in fact, the case? Yeah, I think it was really interesting how they kind of set this up because I I did not know all this background. I'm not somebody who's followed gymnastics. I might watch it on the Olympics when it comes on, but I'm not somebody who really knows much about, if anything, about the sport. So hearing them kind of set up how he was looked up to and his place in the sport. And I think right in the beginning, somebody said something like their bullshit detector did not go off with Nasser. He was on the um, I Love This Jim Castic podcast. Yes. I, I didn't know there was such a thing. Um, There's a podcast about, for everything, Laura. You know, I guess so. <laughs> um, but, it, but you hear these parents talking about, you know, how this was the person that they all knew they wanted. If they had their, you know, little gymnast that had something wrong, this was the person they took them to. And, the, and you have the girl talking about how he he smuggled one Skittle in. Oh, yes. You know, a whole mm-hmm. one it, it, Skittle. One whole Skittle. And he treated kids for free if the parents couldn't afford to eat. And I'm like, hmm, now I kind of know why. But but it was interesting hearing, you know, that sort of how he was perceived in the community because I think that really does set up how it was that this went under the radar the way that it did for as long as it did. Now, Toby, there's a wonderful sort of opening scene in this podcast that connects us to a moment in pop culture that I think we probably all remember, except for Laura, who didn't have TV in her rural Vermont (laughs) (laughs) home. On her first try, Carrie Strug botches the landing. It's right on her butt. I I don't know the last time Carrie Strug did something like that. This is her Carrie walks back to the vault, limps a little, and her eyes are focused. She knows what to do. She will go when she is ready. Carrie stretches her arms all the way up, takes a couple of breaths, and then barrels towards the vault like her ankle doesn't even hurt. She sticks the landing beautifully. But as the crowd goes nuts, Carrie falls to her knees, crawls away from the vault. On that TV screen... There's a young trainer helping to hold Carrie up. I got her, I got her, I got her, he says. Pause that. That guy. That guy right there. That's Larry Nassar. Toby, do you remember when Carrie Strug landed that one-footed vault in the Olympics, winning the USA women's gymnastics team their first gold medal in basically, like, forever, right? Uh, Sure, you know what else I remember? What's that? Was how weird it was that her coach like Bella Caroli or whatever his name was, like picked her up and was carrying her like a baby. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I I remember watching that and being like, ugh, that's a little weird. Actually, listening to that brought back, that was the exact memory I I thought of in the the context of this. And I'm certainly not saying anything about Bella Caroli. It kind of reminded me that there are, I mean, at least from a distance and watching the like the very high level of it at the Olympics, it's like these young girls – and these male coaches who are very, you know, for want of a better word, hands on in mm-hmm. a lot of ways, it seems like there's just it's just ripe with opportunity. So you just have to be careful about who who you're putting in those situations of authority. And I think, you know, the, the whole idea of authority, maybe we'll talk about this later, 
it seems like that becomes a big deal with the Nasser thing. Right. Is, is that it's he's such an authority that you know, especially for people who are like have the opportunity to have their daughters be treated by him, like this guy who's treating like the Olympic stars and stuff. Like that's just got to be a big. I mean, that must seem like it's great. Like he's she's going to be getting the best possible medical attention, and it's like this great thing. And you know, the reality is he's like this rampant pedophile. Right now, I, I do think you know something that you mentioned that I think. It could be its own podcast. I know there's been a lot of reporting on it, like, you know, through the years, but it strikes me, and I think it strikes you too over and over again. This sport in particular and the effect it has on the girls in particular that participate in it, obviously, it seems like there's a tremendous amount of passion from the participants. You know, there's a whole description of how their hands just get like ripped apart, and it's like a badge of honor to be bleeding from your hands. There's a whole description about how it's okay, it feels like a treat to have one Skittle, sort of that normalization of like weight stuff and eating stuff, and this normalization of just like the physical toll that this sport takes on bodies. And yes, the normalization of these very juvenile looking women, some of you know whom and are 19, 20 in their early 20s, and you know, they're in college, they're 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 participating in the sport at the highest level, really being objectified like little girls. If you look at the fashion of gymnastics, the ponytails, like the glitter spray and the hair, there is something there that we just all accept as like these are the aesthetics of the sport and this is what happens in the sport and oh yeah by the way it also ruins your body that really could be its own podcast don't you think toby don't they have that isn't gymnast cast <laughs> gymcastic, gymcastic. Is yeah. Rebecca. <laughs> yeah. okay it's the fucking og of gymnastic podcast baby <laughs> there is this constant I, I know i think it's in like most sports is that what men wear and what women wear to do roughly the same things are quite different. Oh, yeah. No shit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Ice skating, gymnastics. Tennis. Right. Like swimming is one of the few that I could, you know, swimming and maybe basketball. So I I think there there is like this weird like sexualization of a lot of sports. It's just you're so used to it, right? Like my earliest memories of gymnastics are like Nadia Comaneci. Yep. Way back when. And she's wearing the exact same stuff that these guys are. That's right. right? She's wearing like a leotard with long sleeves. Yeah. I mean, I think that this past Olympics, you know, there was an amazing, um, Kevin, do you remember that amazing infographic the New York Times did on how and why Simone Biles is basically oh, the best gymnast in the yeah, world? Yeah, showing her jump and Show, the, yeah. showing like her tumbling Probably, pass. Yeah, yeah. And like just the sheer athleticism of these athletes is like unbelievable. Right. Just that, you know, the toll on the bodies, it all makes sense, like when it all comes down to it. Are we talking about all this because we're we don't want to talk about the oh, no, icky stuff? I'm getting there right now. We are okay. All right. I just have noticed that we have really sidestepped the difficult conversation I thought we would be having. Well, it's because I don't think we're eager to talk he's about it. In and yeah. like what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, is this shocking that like this would be the hunting ground for a predator? A world where. A tiny girl can have a man have his hands all over her, and we see it on national TV, and it's just part of the sport. Toby says he thought it was weird, but like it's also just part of the sport. I mean, this is a perfect hunting ground for a predator, is it not? Yeah, I mean, I don't think he was the guy who said, I'm going to go to medical school because I want to do this. He would have done this no matter what his job he was. Right, no. exactly. He would have done it, whatever. But he did end up getting into a... A he position chose a specialty, where? perhaps. Took a specialty. He certainly sought out that kind of job, and yeah, it's an opportunity. It's it's like a prime venue for grooming. That's what when when you're what you're talking about, Rebecca. It's yes. like it just it's it's like just conducive to creepy, inappropriate behavior. I, I want to take back my statement. The guy did he molested at least two hundred people. So maybe this is the guy who actually did go to medical school just to do yes, this. Yes. And it's also yeah. a sport that where they say like if you have pain, don't talk about it. If you're yeah, not feeling yeah. great, don't talk about yeah, it. Yeah, it's a lot of sports are so, like that. But yes, yeah. but is that not a prime ground for grooming? Yeah. All right. Well, I I want to move on to episode two. I want to tell people who are hesitant to listen to this podcast because of the subject matter. Again, if you're going to listen to any of it, listen to episodes one and two. Episode two is a story of a teenage girl whose story goes exactly the way it would go if this was one of our daughters, right? She has scoliosis. She has all these medical problems. She gets the opportunity. Her parents have the opportunity to send her to the best, most well-respected doctor in this field. They send her there. She has to go to the appointment alone because it's the middle of the school day. She has an experience where she is sexually abused by Larry Nassar at a doctor's appointment. She goes back to school and tells her friends that it happened. And then she goes home and tells her parents that it happened. 
happened, her parents believe her and go to the cops immediately. And then Larry Nasser does a fucking PowerPoint presentation oh. to convince a detective <sighs> that he's just doing a regular medical procedure, which involves him putting his hands in her vagina. Kevin, thoughts? I thought that that was incredible. And he probably, you know, sitting there making, he probably had multiple copies of that uh, PowerPoint so he could pull it out when he, he needed to. And he just kind of used, you know, intimidated, I don't even say intimidated, but he- uh, he, he mansplained. He, he, on that cop, he was able to use his medical knowledge and his degree and sort of his pedigree saying, oh, yeah, and I you know, think the cop, he apologized years later, but I think he realized, you know, yeah, he just kind of snowballed me, and I was willing to believe it because he was a respected doctor. And it wasn't, and by having this PowerPoint, it wasn't just saying, oh, I didn't do that. He had, like, what seemed like a reasonable explanation. If he didn't know that what he did was not that procedure, we hear from a different doctor saying, yeah, that's a legitimate procedure. That's not what he was doing here. Right. Yeah. But Laura, I mean, this mom did all the right things. Yeah. I mean, she even went so far as to when the cops didn't follow it up, she was like, yeah, all right, well, I want to have a meeting with him at least so he knows that he should not do this this way again with no nurse in the room, with no gloves, with whatever. Like, yeah. She did everything like, exactly what we would do, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. And I was just absolutely, it, it's kind of horrific to listen to that they're like, they just took his word like, oh, yeah, well, he's got a PowerPoint. So that seemed official. So this must be true. And this must be how it's supposed to be. And end of story. And it's just like, times have changed since since that report was made. But just the, the fact that it seemed appropriate that he would be in there while she undressed I mean, even now, when I go to the girl doctor, she comes in, she the says hello, she, she goes out in the hallway. Otherwise known as a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I think she means gynecologist. I mean, the one where you put your feet in the stirrups. Oh, okay. She goes out yeah. in the hallway. The one for gyno she doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't come in and watch you change, even oh, when yeah, you're a grown yeah. up for crying out loud. So I'm like, so what is this poor girl going there yeah. by herself? And and like nobody, this doesn't raise any alarm bells to anybody. Like, oh no, he had a PowerPoint. That's cool. Yep. There's no nurse in the room. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's yeah. been a rule for a long time. Yeah. That's not new. That was a rule when I yeah. was like growing up. Yeah. But can yeah. we just talk in a you know broad sense about um, the description of the assault? Yeah. Because I will say, look, there was if you think about it, there was no mood music. There were no like fancy quick edits. They didn't do. They the didn't try to. Yeah. Yeah. The language wasn't graphic it was, it was plain language and it wasn't overly descriptive but it was descriptive enough that it took my breath away yep i i gasped out loud i i was uh you know surprised at how i'll just say it, i was triggered yeah. you know i was i thought it was i was like wow yeah, yeah. and i was felt really i felt really uncomfortable and i think as a i need to feel that way yep. in order to get what's going on here yeah especially i think for guys especially for us because it's the kind of thing where, you know, we say we're we're all in, but we, you know, unless we've actually kind of like been confronted by the reality of this, you're like, wow, I had no idea that that, you know, it was that shocking. Yeah. Well, I, th I think that was effective because I think normally when we hear these stories or we read about these stories, we hear the sort of sanitized language about it. You know, they don't get into the actual act itself you know i've seen descriptions of this working in defense when i'm reading court you know reading the police reports and stuff but the general public doesn't hear that so i think it was very effective in the way that it was done i mean it was hard to listen to but it really you know made the point it really illustrated and and you felt this visceral reaction when you heard it like wow this is what he was doing to kids you know so it, i think i think it served its purpose um i think it was an interesting decision it was probably something they talked about a lot like how much detail do we include i think for some people it maybe was too much but i think yeah for for me i feel like it was effective if you if they're really trying to illustrate why this case was so egregious yeah i think there are a lot of people at that point probably dropped out right at that time code because because it is really powerful not me. I actually wanted yeah. to listen more at that time. Yeah, sure. Code. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about episode three, which is easily even more difficult and more Ugh. explicit. And probably if you have listened to this podcast and you are a woman, I would not be surprised if you, like me, like the girl on the bus who was sitting in the bench with 
Kyle, who tells us, you know, whose story we hear here, I wouldn't be surprised if I'm just going to say three out of four, maybe four out of five women listening to this podcast right now, just like me, say, oh, yeah, that same exact thing happened to me as a kid. This is a very, very familiar and common story of predation that we hear in episode three. This is a friend of the family who went to their house every Sunday who Larry Nasser would sit in a blanket next to on the couch with a blanket and molest her right in front of her brother who would play hide and seek with her and molest her during hide and seek who had a code with her of silence that when she broke... Her parents betrayed her in in a lot of ways. I mean, it seems like maybe they tried sort of half-heartedly. But listening as a parent in 2018, I think we all know that in 2018, knowing what we know now and the experiences I think many of us had as kids that we never talked about as kids that we are talking about now in this moment in time. If one of my kids in 2018 said so and so touched me and someone looked at me funny, like my kid would never be alone with that person ever again. Period. And I would tell everybody not to let their kids ever be alone with that person ever again. That was not the time that Kyle grew up in. It she grew up in the same kind of time that I grew up in and that you grew up in Laura and that you grew up in Kevin. Yeah. This shit is not uncommon, but I think just hearing it so plainly, here's what happened and here's what my parents did was incredible and so incredibly painful. Uh, Laura, what did you think of episode three of this podcast? Um, This one was just awful. I think it was just awful because I could really visualize this girl on the couch. I could visualize her playing hide and seek, hiding by the furnace and not for a long time realizing that this was wrong. Yeah. But listening to it just like, oh, God. I mean, just... Oh, just this poor kid. But then the freaking parents, that's the part where I was like, okay, here comes the Brichter scale. Because like the fact that, you know, they kept, oh, well, Larry wouldn't do that. But then they, they, well, she says, go tell your father. You have to tell your father. And just the shame that this girl felt, like just the way that they treated her when she reported. And then when it was resolved and they made her like come and have this big sit down with them and Larry, like, are you kidding me? I, it just uh, times have changed, and it, and I know this, this things like this did happen. I do know people that this happened to, but just this episode was tough listening. I, again, I think it's important. I think it, it raises a level of awareness, but at the same time, really hard to listen to. Kevin, what do you think of this mandatory reporter who didn't report because there just wasn't enough there? Yeah, I was I was I was troubled by that. You know, again, it's the kind of thing where it, it seems like. You're not playing by the system because you believe the other guy. You believe yeah. the guy who's the perpetrator. And it's easier. That's and that is the thing. I mean, that's that's why it's the title and it's so appropriate. It's about being believed. And the reason why don't you come forward, lady? Because I didn't think anyone was going to believe me. And if you're questioning me now, you obviously didn't or weren't going to, or you still don't. This guy. And was, that's why it's a problem. But this guy was very, very good. This yes, at his Nasser power was very, plays, very good. And his question power about, plays. Yes, yeah, power plays and his power points. The doctor they were talking about there, I just can't believe Yeah, you should have reported it. Just say, I didn't see there was enough there. That's not really for him to decide. Exactly. That's why you're a mandatory reporter, not a discretionary reporter, right? right? He was creepy too, though. Like, what yes, the hell? Geez. I mean, he sounded even as creepy as Nasser in a way. Like, oh, God. There's like no child advocacy center person doing an interview. I mean, obviously there wasn't. We weren't in that time period, but wow. Well, I think the one thing that's relatable to me is that I think that there is a before and after in these situations. So like, say your kid comes to you and says, your best friend, dad, is molesting me. I mean, there's obviously the time and place kind of thing, but like really think about it. Think about like your best friend that you see every week. You may have the instinct to slow walk that a little bit. Your first instinct is denial. You know that if you pursue it, nothing will ever be the same. Mm-hmm. You know you you know that like there will be the before we accused my best friend of being a child molester and the after we accused my best friend of being a child molester. So on the one hand- Or your I, uncle or your whomever, right? right? Yeah. And on the one hand, you kind of want to give, I want to give, even as somebody who has had similar experience as a kid, like I want to give the parents just a little bit of benefit of the doubt here, not for what they did or didn't do, but because of the situation they were in and because there is the before and after, you know- If this is something that gets out there and God forbid our kid is wrong or doesn't understand or is just, you know, lying or something, 
then you can never put this, you can never close this Pandora's box once you open it. It's scary, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> then there is the other part of the story where they then just resume the friendship and bring her back to that house and encourage her to babysit for Larry Nasser. And he's driving her home alone, uh. knowing that she is uncomfortable with him. That, to me, is what brought it over the line. If she comes and tells you that, and you're like, well, you know, he does seem to go down to the basement and hang out with them right. while we're, you know, over at their house quite a bit. That might be a clue. And then how old is she when she tells them? I mean, she's pretty young. Yep. I thought she was 12 when she told them. But but it, it started when going, she was like six or something. It had been happening for yeah. years, and yeah. She, she only recognized yeah. it when she was 12 because of that conversation she had with her friend on the bus. Right. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I have a hard time... Like, it just seems like those parents had blinders on. I agree. Well, we also find out that similar to epi- the episode two story, this is also a, a family dealing with a lot of shit, right? The father was dying. Same as the girl in episode two. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, the parents clearly, I mean, I'm, I'm. this is not me excusing the parents. I'm just trying to imagine what Kyle is feeling as she is processing this story, right? She is telling yeah. this story to these reporters and like telling it beautifully and like clearly her life is okay and like a lot of people who have experienced this as a kid have gone on to have like perfectly normal lives because this is by her the way boyfriend's hot. Yes, super hot. It's a super universal experience and I think that we don't talk about that enough. And one of the things I love so much about this episode is hearing Kyle tell the story and like not through the lens of like oh this woman's life was ruined because of x y and z but through the this happened to me. I tried to do something about it. Nobody believed me. I called the cops myself when I was 21 to try to like get them mm-hmm. to pay attention to this child molester. And I'm not surprised at all that he was arrested. Like, it was a really brave story that this woman, Kyle, told. I keep thinking like how there could be 250 episodes of this podcast because it seems like each story, while similar, is different, yeah. right? It's unique. You know, each one is just so powerful. It was like the victim impact statements in the courtroom. There were two hundred and something episodes of yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And he wanted to. He wanted. To, he couldn't take it anymore. He wanted to skip it. It was really uncomfortable for, for him. him. Ugh. It's tough. Although I think it's Larry Nasser looks an awful lot like Rod Ro- Rosenstein. Don't What's you think? that, Larry Nasser? Ro- he does. Rosenstein, yeah. Oh, that's an unfortunate comparison. Yeah. Oh, poor, yeah. Oh, Kevin. What's that? I don't know. I just was looking at him and said, when do I know that face? <laughs> oh, yeah. He's the deputy attorney general. God. Okay. Well, uh, why don't we do what we do and um, uh, give this podcast a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Should our listeners check it out? Obviously, we've acknowledged it's a difficult podcast, subject matter wise, but is it a good podcast? Is it worth listening to? Is it interesting? Is it is it a spoonful of medicine or is it actually a good podcast that our listeners should check out? Laura Bricker, I'm going to start with you. Thumbs up or thumbs down for Believed from Michigan Radio and NPR. I'm going to say thumbs up. I I think it is an important podcast. I think it's something that, you know, it's hard to listen to, um, but the episodes are short. So, you know, you if you can, you, yeah. it's not like Just you're going to have to listen. Yeah, it's they, not they, two you hours have to listen of, for yeah. an hour of, yeah. of this <laughs> horrific, dramatic <laughs> stuff. Um, so I'd say... Give it a listen. Kevin, I just think about what you said. <laughs> you want to take a Silkwood shower after listening to this oh, podcast? Yeah. Toby Ball, what about you? Thumbs up or thumbs down for Believe? Should people check it out? Not just is it an important podcast, but is it a good podcast? What do you think? Yeah, well, at the risk of making you angry, I think it should come with a trigger warning in that it is it's a tough listen. And, and I'm sure much tougher for people who've had experience with that. But yeah, I mean, it's really well done. You know, it's a tough story to tell, and I think they do a good job letting these young women tell that story. Mm. It's super powerful. I definitely give it a thumbs up, but I th- I do think that, you know, if you feel like that's a kind of thing that might be triggering, like it probably will be, mm. would be my guess. I give this podcast a very big thumbs up. I am not triggered by it, even though I really relate to a lot of the stories I've heard in it. I actually think it's probably less triggering for someone like me uh, who can relate than it would be to somebody who perhaps is learning about the details of these kinds of crimes. I also think that, um, you know, my one criticism and Kevin, I, I know that this was a kind of, it's kind of along the lines of what you said. It's not to me the way that the hosts deliver the show. It is uh, what I hear is uh, this was a, a local station, uh, Michigan Radio, who's making the show, and then NPR came in and decided to collaborate with them on it. I hear a little too much of that collaborative influence. I hear a lot of conventions, a lot of like 
And now we're going to be doing this kind of conventions Mm -hmm. that I think was probably the result of the collaboration, like the too many cooks thing. I do hear that a little bit in this podcast. I kind of would have loved to have heard the version of this that just these two reporters did with Michigan Radio without the NPR collaboration. I wonder if it would have been a little grittier, a little bit less, quote, palatable. But I do like the style of the host, generally speaking. And um, I think it's a really, really great podcast and not just important, but also a good podcast with a good story and not just one that I should have to listen to, but one that I'm actually enjoying listening to as much as you can enjoy a podcast about a child molester. uh, I really like the show. I'm going to keep listening to it. What about you, Kevin? Thumbs up or thumbs down for Believed? I think you're pretty special, Rebecca. (laughs) Um, I'm a thumbs up. And, uh, yeah, it is a hard listen at times, um, but I think it's a, an important topic. And I don't think anybody's kind of done it like this. It's, you know, it could have gone the way of Gladiator and Spotlight, you know, sort of that feel. Clinical, yeah. Right, clinical and, very, yeah, and, and um, surgical. Yeah. Uh, it, it, this is more plain language uh, for a bigger story. They have yet to get to the part where we look at the bigger picture and the different people around and U.S. gymnastics and, you know. I can't wait for that we're getting stuff. yeah Those we're, fucking people. We're, yeah, we, so <laughs> in that way, it is, it is very much like Gladiator in the sense that there is a bigger industrial picture around the bad behavior of one person. Like Michigan State? Yeah, so I give it a thumbs up. It's a good podcast. And after all that, we need a little something to pick us up, don't we? Uh, sure. Oh, wait, are you trying to make an ad transition out of the super difficult podcast? I just, yeah. How about you just read the ad? That's what I'm going to (laughs) do. Uh, we're brought to you by FabFitFun. Yes. There's a good pick-me-up, huh? We need that after listening to this podcast. Yeah, FabFitFun is a seasonal subscription box with full-size fashion, beauty, home, fitness, and wellness products. And they're delivered four times a year for just $49.99. Actually, they also have these special editor's boxes. Yeah, editor's boxes. So we got our fall box, and we just recently got the fall editor's box. I know. It was like a a gift in the mail. It was exciting. And the winter box is being prepared right now by the- Are we going to get that? Of course we're going to get it. If we don't get it, can you get it for me? Because I really (laughs) freaking love this product. I love getting these freaking boxes in the mail. Well, we're still like enjoying the editor's box. Laura, I know that- you loved picking through the fun things to find in the FabFitFun box. What are, what are some of your favorites? I was super excited to see the, it's called Yoga Detox Bath. It's got two H's on it. <laughs> post practice. You gotta say it. Post. Yoga. It's the Yoga Post Practice Detox Soak, which was super awesome after all of my raging at the gym <laughs> when I was super sore to have that. And also the Summer and Rose bag that came, which was very nice. A very nice bag where I can carry all my fun fab fit fun products around yeah fab fit fun is a fantastic value most of many of the products their individual value is more than the entire cost of the box i know so it's packed with so many great things so it's a great gift for yourself but it also makes a great gift for your loved one christmas is coming it's such a good would be such a great could you imagine sending like a bunch of fab fit boxes to relatives like how freaking excited they would be if they were girls yeah if they were guys (laughs) Yes, you know what? Men have enjoyed the products in this box at our house as much as the women have. I know Toby Let's has. Be real. Because he, he very much enjoys giving it to Deborah. <laughs> Looking yes. like a hero. Sign up for FabFitFun today. FabFitFun boxes are amazing and always sell out. Use our code CRIME, Crime. to get $10 off your first box. Go to FabFitFun.com and sign up and start getting the box for a life well lived. Use promo code CRIME, CRIME. to get 10% off your first box. That's over $200 for only $39.99. $200 of products for just $39.99. Go to fabfitfun.com and use code CRIME to Crime. get $10 off your first FabFitFun box. What else you got, Kevin? Well, Simple Contacts lets you oh. conveniently renew your contacts lens prescriptions and reorder your contacts from anywhere in minutes. It's vision care for the 21st century. Why do you think they say it's vision care for the 21st century? Because in the 21st century, you cannot afford to run out of contacts and not be able to make an appointment or have to order more. You just want them to show up. That's how we are in the 21st century, Kevin. It is, but also think about the test, right? Oh, the technology. The exam, right? The yeah. technology behind it. You can take this self-guided vision so test. So futuristic. Right, it takes five minutes. Now, just a reminder, it's not a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam, but you're going to save so much time on that other part of the exam where you, you, know, you do your um, your contacts. Uh, you, you use um, you, you use your, your phone, yeah. your smartphone. Whole like eye chart situation, the checks for redness, a yeah. doctor reviews the exam. It's amazing. That's right. That's right. Best of all, Simple Contacts saves you money. 
That vision test is only $20, and the contact lens prices are unbeatable. They are. Standard shipping is free. Somebody bought a year's worth. A year's worth. Who? You did. Oh, that's right. A year's worth of contacts from Simple Contacts. And, you know, what I like about it, I don't wear contacts, but I am burdened with contacts. Because I'm the one who works downtown and has to go to your place to pick right. them up. Not anymore. Not anymore. They just come, well, I'm good for at least one year. And then next year, we'll oh, do yeah. the same thing. Totes. We'll just get year supplies of Simple Contacts. You can get $20 off your contacts at simplecontacts.com slash CWO20. Or you just enter code CWO20 at checkout. And I just have to remind folks... Crime Writers On is CWO, not CRO. Oh, yeah. What's up with that? I love I you I do guys. it all the time myself, but you when do? I see that, yeah. Because like, writers, like, we're going to write crime. We're not writing about crime. We're going out there. We're going to fix it. Wait, you are a professional writer. Sometimes it happens. Yeah, it's CWO. Uh, okay. But now you're not going to forget the promo code. Simplecontacts.com slash CWO20 or just enter code CWO20 and get 20% off your contacts. 2020, right? See what no, they just, did there? Uh, just it's twenty. Don't 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 mess it up no, on me. No, but that's why they use twenty, right? Because it's twenty dollars off. That's right, and yeah. that is what twenty twenty. CWO twenty. That's the code. Just one twenty. All right. Not one twenty. Just a single twenty. Couple of quick uh, news updates. I just want to point out a couple of things that happened as a result of Tuesday's election. One is that Judge Galt from Serial was in fact. Re-elected. Oh, it was close, though. It was the closest uh, race. That super racist judge. He's still a judge. Also, I read a really interesting story today about how the election results in Wisconsin could favorably affect the outcomes in both the Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery cases. Apparently, uh, after Scott Walker was sent packing, I think so was his attorney general, was also not re-elected. And uh, some news outlets have called them the men who have the most to gain by keeping uh, both Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey uh. in prison. And they are now both out of office, so I think the legal teams for both of those cases are feeling better after the election on Tuesday. So, listeners, if you're not feeling better after election on Tuesday, <laughs> at least it's good to know that someone is, right? Right. Now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast, a little something I like to call the crime, crime of, of the week. The week. A British resort says it will host the wedding of a woman set to marry a ghost. <laughs> Amethyst Realm says she slept. What's the name? Amethyst Realm is her name. I don't think so. She says Come she on. slept with over 20 apparitions, but now she's ready what? to settle down. She says her unnamed ghost fiance proposed to her at a tourist attraction called Wookie Hole, where they'll <laughs> now have the wedding service. They oh, say what? the ceremony will be performed by the resort's Wookie Witch. Their own spooky mascot named after a stalagmite in the Wookiee cave that looks like a woman turned into stone. The marketing team (laughs) released a statement smartly claiming Ms. Realm is not the first person to experience, quote, out-of-body sensations while visiting Wookiee Hole. (laughs) Ms. Realm and her... That is a lot of bullshit in one story. (laughs) (laughs) This is the crime of the week, Toby. This is serious news. Ms. Realm met her phantom lover while in Australia, and he followed his true love to England. She says her she says her hopes are to become pregnant and carry his ghost baby. Anchor baby. <laughs> wow. So, question for uh, anchor you. Ghost baby. Anchor ghost baby. That's awesome. Oh, got to put a dent to that. So, question for you, panel: What is the perfect wedding gift to give? To a bride and her ghostly groom. Laura Bricker, I'm going to start with you. I I don't even know. I'm going to go with um, the 1986 horror mystery movie called Haunted Honeymoon, starring Gene Wilder (laughs) and Gilda Radner. So they have something to watch on their wedding night because I really don't believe they're having ghost sex. Uh, What about you, Toby? What gift would you buy for a woman and her ghost groom? Vanishing cream. <laughs> <laughs> so she could join him and be invisible? Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't know. She probably thinks it does make her vanish based on <laughs> everything else I've heard about her. What about you, Kevin? What's the wedding gift you would buy for this wonderful couple? The woman and her ghost groom? Uh, lithium? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Laura Bricker, before we end the show, do we have a cat of the week this week? Yeah. 
Uh, we have a dog. It's my my favorite kind of animal. You love the dogs. Our longtime listener, Rebecca Epstein, she's sending me pictures all the time of her dog, Sadie. But this week, there was a very funny exchange on Twitter. She texted a picture of Sadie because I had been posting pictures of Felix the cat who likes to tuck himself into his sheets. And Sadie was also tucked in the bed, but looking kind of like, you know, staring off to the side like she might be dead. And one of our other astute followers, Annie Fox, noted, sweet dog, lovely sheets, but that kind of looks like a scene from The Godfather. (laughs) (laughs) Which revealed that Rebecca has never actually seen The Godfather. Oh, really? Rebstein. Rebstein. Which resulted in another tweet with a photo of the horse head in the bed. So, Sadie, nice sheets. You know, it inspired a lot of good fun on Twitter this week. I bet Toby's never seen The Godfather. Toby, have you? Have you not? What? I've seen The Godfather like (laughs) 15 times or something. You could have watched it 14 and seen The Goonies, but he went for 15. I know. Oh, my God, the Goonies. Goonies, Godfather for the 15th time. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Laura Bricker, people want to submit their dogs to be cat of the week Leave the gun, take the cannoli. (laughs) How can they find you on Twitter? At Laura Bricker. And Toby Ball, people want to tweet to you and once again harass you for never having seen the 1980s classic film starring Corey Feldman and the guy from uh, The Hobbit, Sean (laughs) Ashton. (laughs) The Goonies, how can they find you on Twitter? It just never gets old. Uh, (laughs) At Toby Ball NH. Kevin, plenty of people want to reach out to you and tell you what a wonderful man you are. Or just tell you that you need to empty the dishwasher. How can they find you on Twitter? You can find me at One Eyed Willie, <laughs> the pirate. Really? What's your Twitter handle? It's at Kevin P. Flynn. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you can find me at Reb Lavoy. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Crime Writers On. And I strongly encourage you, strenuously, to join the amazing community in our official Crime Writers On Facebook discussion group. We also have a regular Facebook page. You can go to our website, sign up for our newsletter, support this show on patreon.com slash partners in crime media, and you will get access to the Balls Deep Dive Book Club podcast. Coming soon, an episode about Kevin's all-time favorite true crime book. What is that, Kevin? Homicide, A Year on the Killing Streets by David Simon. Your favorite book of all time. Apparently, Colin Miller and Toby Ball agree. You can also get a free month of Stitcher Premium if you go to stitcherpremium.com slash crime and use the code crime. You'll get access to Mary with Podcast and all sorts of Stitcher Premium podcast content. Our theme song was performed by the New York Sky Jazz Ensemble and used with their permission. This show was recorded in the yoga loft above the bodega in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi studio, otherwise known as Studio C, the closet in our basement where we host speed dating events for ghosts and lonely people. On behalf of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. later. I really thought you were going to go with like a dildo so she could <laughs> actually have sex with something. Uh, wow. Wow. <laughs> All right. All right. And on that note, <laughs> we should probably end it. How come that never made Toby? Oh, it has made Toby's list. Remember those times? That's right. You think you had a bad week? I had to try to figure out a way to do a segue from Believed into uh, Fab Fit Fun. Oh. Want the same expert advice you get from the pros in the store while shopping online at DiscountTire.com? Meet Treadwell, your personal online tire guide that matches you with the perfect tire for your vehicle. Get your best match in one minute or less with Treadwell by Discount Tire.